solitude, bitches. A moment away from the noise of daily life. A chance to be mindful, reflective, to quiet that inner monologue with a gentle shut the f up and to enjoy the present. Being alone, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, allows you to fully appreciate the little things in life. Sounds, smells, textures, and obviously, tastes. All you gotta do is put down your phone, pick up a fork, and treat yourself to a meal. Imagine enjoying a meal without someone asking for a bite of what you ordered. Ooh, can I get a bite of that? What better place to practice being alone than in the serene greenery of Oregon? I mean, just look at that shit. But if you're still not convinced of the benefits of solitude, just ask a local. As we'd say in Portland, like, get over it. Karen Brooks is an award-winning food writer based in Portland. Seriously, she's like the food critic in the city. She's been at it since veal marsala was the it dish. There's no reason dining alone should have a stigma. It certainly doesn't in Portland. Doesn't matter if it's the mayor or your hairdresser, everyone here dines alone. Hello. When you try something yourself, other kinds of adventures and experiences might open up. And this adventure begins, as all adventures do, with coffee. All things in life for me begin at Courier. Courier Coffee is a Portland institution that roasts its own coffee and offers bean delivery by bike. The owner, Joel, has had dreams to open a coffee shop ever since middle school. This is Portland, after all. In addition to Java, Courier sells pastries like this ooey, gooey, scrumdiddly umptious chocolate chip cookie. Hmm, I'll take a dozen. Good morning. Hello. Joel, I need my chocolate. I have to have a chocolate chip cookie. All right, we can do that. Get me a good one. OK. I kind of like this one. Which one's the one? Well, I think this is the right one because it has a slight indentation, so you know that it's a little less well done on the inside, so it has that contrast, like the perfect level of doneness. This is the one that I would choose for myself. Let's do it. OK. I have one of the chocolate chip cookies every day. I eat them like vitamins. That chocolate zings right to my brain, and I believe it opens up my mind I think I tend to be a lot like some of the chefs I'm interested in. Very obsessive, down the rabbit hole. What does a place look like? Uh, what is the chef doing? What's, what's the color of the chef's hair? It will be in a spicy idea. idea. Oh my gosh. So let's look at Career Coffee Shop. Just as they want to make every bite count, I want to make every word count. David, David, they're perfect. Oh, cool. Perfect day. The day is just beginning for Karen, who usually rides out her cookie high with lunch at one of the city's many counter spots, like this place, Eam. Eam is surely the world's first Thai Texas barbecue tiki cocktail joint. It's like the missing link that we didn't know was missing. I kind of love just drifting in here by myself. Karen. How are you? Good, good, good. Food and drink? Um, so I'm going to try a couple different things to drink. You're going boozy or not boozy? You know me, I want a little of everything. 
So many people, when they're doing virgin cocktails, all the fun is gone. It's like, oh, like put a soda in a glass. Everything is equalized here. I love it. And then we've got the little, I don't know, rat in a truck, I don't know. Ah, oh, look at that. That's perfection. You ready for some food? Yeah, ready to eat anytime. Cool, I'll put your order in. All right, awesome. Yay! All right, all right. Pork steak and barbecue fried rice. Mm. It's fast and furious and smoky and spicy and slathered in good vibes and umbrella drinks. That's a Portland restaurant. One upside of being by yourself is you're not obliged to share any of those juicy burnt ends, which Ian bathes in a Thai-style barbecue sauce. Mm. All soups going forward should have smoked burnt brisket ends from Texas. Anybody can enjoy a solo lunch, but late meals alone have a tendency to feel scary. <laughs> but guess what? Karen don't care about rolling up without a plus one. Hello. Hi. Evening, uh, Karen, for uh, one at the chef's counter. Nice. I'll be right this way. All right. Way. Thank you. Han Oak serves homestyle Korean dishes. Homestyle is in. This is the chef's actual home. Seriously, that's one of his kids. Hi, cutie. The first time I ever walked in here. I thought, is this a house party? Is this a serious food situation? Is this the new Korean mom and pop place? And it turned out it, it was all of them. They even have free valet parking. I mean, we are essentially in Peter and Son's home. They literally live on the other side of the wall. Hun Oak exemplifies what makes Portland, Portland. There's a belief here that you can really make anything happen. Come on, come on, come on over. Come sit with me for a minute. Hey, did you order me a cocktail? I didn't, I didn't, but come and have a drink. Sit, sit down. Peter is the owner and chef of Han Oak. He makes playful and innovative Korean dishes. Chef Peter and his wife, son, lived the New York City chef's grind for a decade. But after seeing basically no one balance 100-hour work weeks with family life, he peaced out and went back to Portland. With his wife's help, he created a concept that had room for both food and family. Mm, that's really yummy. Sweet. Are you ready to eat? We're ready. All right, we're bringing out some food. All right. A few plates of punchan. All right, let me just kind of group these around here. Ooh, I'm going in. Mm. We got our snack plate. Snacks. Yeah. I love snacks. snacks. <laughs> Korean fried chicken with the dusting of the essence of instant ramen. Served with an okonomiyaki, or Japanese pancake, that's been waffle-fied. I love this titanic crunch. Mm. I want that dust on everything. Could you put it on a donut? Please? Sure. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. And the pork and chive dumplings. Oh my gosh. Wish me luck here. Mm. All right. This is quite the feast mm. here, Karen, but we mm. do have mm -hmm. one last thing. It's so delicious. Uh, beef noodle soup with the uh, ramen noodles. Oh my gosh. Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. Mmm. The soup is just boss. I love, like, just the chef's counter alone, like the center of gravity. I like to eat by myself, and I'm able to feel part of your world. And that's that's what the chef's counter kind of has always given us, is that, that space to be able to sort of hang out. Yeah. Do you need a bowl of rice, maybe? No. Yes, rice yeah. is always good. Okay. <laughs> the night is just beginning. Add a girl, Karen. That's the spirit. Washington is brimming with splendors. Waterfalls, 
mountainscapes, the Space Needle, and noodles. Rich and silky, like these soba noodles served with crunchy tempura. Chef Matsuko is a master of the art of Japanese soba noodle making. This is for 15 portions. I make about 10 times a day. The first four times is really meditating. After that, I'll be like me. Matsuko is the owner of Kamonegi, the award-winning soba joint serving modern meats traditional Japanese dishes. She painstakingly grinds buckwheat from scratch daily and uses her grandmother's recipe, sometimes making tiny recipe adjustments based on weather and temperature. Then she precisely cuts the dough into thin noodles with the coolest looking utensil ever made. It's called a kiri knife. In Japan, soba is typically enjoyed alone. Japanese people eat noodles so fast, like in two minutes, this is gone. So sometimes you don't need a company, but American people enjoy conversation, so it takes one hour to consume. If you talk too much, you can taste. <laughs> Words to live by. Less talk, more noodles. Soba may taste better if you inhale it in two minutes, but what if you really want to linger and make a night of it? That's when you hit Ado because shouldn't you splurge on the person that matters most? We get a lot of solo diners here. Anybody's welcome. I've been a solo diner at a restaurant before. It can be pretty awkward. Sometimes people don't understand what that is. They're like, oh, is there, are you waiting for somebody to show up? You know, there's just dumb things that you can ask people that makes them feel more and more like shit. <laughs> Eric is the chef owner of Ado in Seattle. Whoa! He's also the owner of a giant flamethrower. His creativity makes him a great chef, and his energy makes him a great host. You know, I played trumpet when I was a little kid, and one of the things I gravitated towards was improvisation. So we don't have recipes here. You know, it's a day-by-day -day menu. I write it down by hand. At the end of the night, we throw it away. We start from scratch the next day. Ado can do pretty much anything, from tasting menus to sandwiches to Puerto Rican feasts. You can come to Otto dozens of times and never have the same experience twice. How are you? Good. Eric. Sharon. Nice to meet you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you. So there's a counter service that we do here at Otto. That's, I would say, like our most experimental. It's kind of like being in a DJ booth. <laughs> yes, it's alive. I know, oh. it's just creeping me out. <laughs> Tonight we're going to be cooking Dungeness crab and doing a seven course dinner off of that. We're going to smoke one. Uh, we're gonna cook one over Japanese charcoal. You know, everything from smoke and fire to ice to pretty much everything in between. You know, think about it more than just going, here's crab, here's some butter, go at it. Um, this is a chawan mushi. It's a Japanese egg custard. Oh, we're gonna start you off like that. It'll get scallions, a crab base, and a little bit of seaweed. There's a lot of flavor there. The texture's really nice. It's like a little hug in a bowl. Hug in a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> it smells like spring. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> These women are total strangers, <laughs> but tonight in the auto universe, they're each other's plus ones. I just don't have the time or the energy to make new friends. Yeah. Is it like on purpose or just kind of your- On purpose. On purpose. Introvert, anxiety, yeah. I don't like small talk. Yeah. But coming to a restaurant like this is helpful because I can go ahead and sit down and eat by myself or you are so engaging. I, I feel bad sometimes, because I feel like I'm bothering, you know? But I don't, because I'm like, hey, you're in my restaurant. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the thing we're doing is like giving the diner enough time to experience it for themselves. And it tastes very different, and there's a different texture, there's a different aesthetic that they're used to. It shows the flexibility of what that ingredient can be. Eric aims to utilize and honor all parts of the food he prepares, like crab brain, which he turns into a custardy sauce for these handmade noodles. Hey, this one's had a good hair day. Yeah. <laughs> Tapping into his Puerto Rican roots, Eric serves dishes like mofongo, fried mashed plantains in broth, 
but topped with a bump of caviar. <laughs> wow, so good. Good. So this is actually a truffle ice cream. The texture is so good. It's amazing. These are the crab legs. This has a little bit of hickory aroma on there. I'm having way too much fun with the smoke. <laughs> Feel free to put the shells back in here, uh, in the shell collection, but yeah. Well, it's the yeah. Wow. Hey, you see that woman over there? Blissed out over crab brain pasta? That's Dr. Sharon Saw, and she is in the zone. Dr. Sa, who's been practicing Buddhism since the mid-90s and is a professor of Buddhist studies, stumbled upon mindful eating in a book at the library. A book led to a monastery, which led to Dr. Sa becoming a trained mindful eating practitioner. Mindful eating actually comes from the Buddhist tradition. It's a form of practice that allows you to develop a kind of present moment awareness so that when we're eating, we're just eating. It's really about learning how to slow down and have the meal be a very sensory experience. I, of course, look at my food to get a sense of texture and colors and combinations, paying attention just to the beauty of it and the aesthetics of the food itself. It was silky, it was very delicate. I check in also with the smell of my food. Usually I'll pick up my bowl and I'll, I'll smell it and try to get a sense of what flavors are in the meal. And focus on the sound. And then I'll eat. Letting the food linger first before swallowing and moving on to the next bite. It's just a really natural way of appreciating the food itself and also learning how to appreciate and really think about all the things that went into making this meal. Maybe it's the person who cooked the meal. You know, you end up thinking about all the different ways that this meal has come to you and it also allows you to express gratitude while you're eating. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to what was going on around me. I was thinking about what it reminded me of, and it really did remind me of the sea. How are we doing as far as mindful eating in your eyes oh, so far? Oh, just great. OK. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is in my mouth. Oh, perfect. The crab's mind is also in her mouth, when you think about it. I'll be back. Awesome. calls her Melissa. Her friends call her Mel. But most people know her as the woman slinging drinks and cooking Real Amin's world-famous fried chicken. A woman who truly does it all. It's always one person working. You are running an entire bar and cooking chicken. You're the world's smallest little fryer on the planet that makes all the magic happen. Look at that. Yep, crisp it up. Oregon bars are required to sell food according to local liquor laws. So it's no surprise that they choose to serve fried chicken. All of those hot, juicy bits pair nicely with an ice cold beer, and the grease helps soak up the booze if you overdo it. People come here for our chicken, definitely. It's antibiotic free, it's never frozen. So we really start with a quality product that we care about, and then we just enhance it with some special dust. 
and then fry it with love. Wow, it looks good. There's that for you. Careful, it's really, really hot. I will. Don't burn your face. I will certainly try not to. If you were here at night, this is a madhouse. There's standing room only. There's chicken on every table. It gets a little wild here. And these guys work so hard. I mean, the chicken from the morning till dawn till dusk. <laughs> it's one reason why I love working here and I love living in Portland is the people are so kind and warm and friendly. There you go, darling. I feel like I've found a second family just by meeting all of the regulars. Everyone has something in common. You just have to fight it. And I think a lot of people that come in here solo, they always know that they can come in here and, and find someone to talk to. <laughs> you were hungry today. <laughs> More than I thought. That <sighs> was satisfying. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it can be rainy in Portland. Dreary, cold. But that's perfect introspection weather. This is a city where the elements encourage you to take some time for yourself. Reflect. Look inward. Really think about why you've done what you've done. Sometimes, you need to go to detention. Detention. What did you do to wind up here? here, here. Taking responsibility for your bad choices. Sometimes that reflection is needed. Reflection is needed. Reflection is needed. But in this detention, you're never alone. Never, never, never. I kind of lost track of what I was saying. I don't know. Detention is a bar in the Kennedy School, a former Portland elementary school that's been converted into a hotel. And a hotel bar is basically a free pass to drink by yourself. But detention, like all good bars, fosters camaraderie among drinkers. The traveler. The regular. Cheers, my friend. <laughs> the therapist. If you find yourself feeling lonely in the dark northwestern winters, you might just need to spend some quality time in a place filled with great conversation, strong old fashions, and those little maraschino cherries. This is an amarini cherry, sweet Italian cherry. Yeah, that's what I said. It's a place to be alone, but with others. Even in the vast, unpopulated forests of Oregon, where you could really let one rip and no one would hear. There are pockets of civilization. Like Subtle Lodge. Just inside this really cool front door is a warm fire, live music, a bar, and a bitchin' fish sandwich. Unlike your classic fish and chips, this trout is breaded with actual potato chips. Then it's deep fried and served on a bun with tartar sauce, pickles, briny lettuce, and a heap of french fries for sustenance. It's not just a supremely crunchy sandwich. For this regular, it's a philosophical experience. You know, when I think of food and eating it, Really, it's honoring the life of the fish by eating it slowly. It is giving its life that my life can continue. Mmm. That's definitely popping. This is Skip. Skip is a poet of the wilderness. He's also a nature sculptor. In fact, Subtle Lodge is filled with his work which is probably why they named the bar after him. Skip lives deep in the mountains in Sisters, Oregon, 
where he spends a lot of time alone, carving wood and meditating. He scouts the forest for fallen trees and turns them into art. And he's really good at it. Like, really good. This piece is one of my best ever. It's carved in a burl maple, all of the burls. And wherever I saw a burl, I thought, man, there's a lot of buffalo in there. I've been carving now for about 50 years. So what you're seeing today is 50 years of accumulated knowledge about how to approach wood and what I love about wood carving. Skip draws his inspiration from the natural world, carving the animals he runs with. Living out here in the woods lets him fully appreciate life, nature, and of course, food. It takes, you know, the quietness. It takes being alone in order to fully appreciate the gifts that we have offered to us. It's through the experience of the self that you understand the world. What is this all about? What is this magic that we're living in really about? You better be able to draw from some energy outside of yourself that's bigger than you. And I see the energy coming from the natural world. Food is our connectedness to the earth. The energy of the food, which is supporting me, is something to really honor. It takes a moment of reverence, and that's done privately and one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Mmm, good sandwich. Mmm. You know, there's something to be said about eating alone. Because you don't have to be worried too much about manners. <laughs> Here's to it. Let's drink to it. Eat on, Skip. Manners be damned. Welcome change eating alone. It's a time to look inward or even meet new people. For some, it's a chance to commune with Mother Nature and properly appreciate the sacrifice of one real crunchy fish. For others, it's a way to escape the constant distraction of the city. But you don't have to have a reason to eat alone. Sometimes, it's just nice to have a good meal with the person who knows you best. So good. Did you see my tower? This is the elevator. <laughs> Everybody needs a tower, right? I don't know if it starts again. 